Good morning, One City. How y'all doing this morning? Everybody ready to worship? I told the first service that that's what we're going to do when we get to heaven, and we're going to do it all together. Is everybody ready to worship with your neighbor? Let's stand to our feet. We invite you to worship on this morning. Nothing is impossible with God. Say that with me. Nothing is impossible with God. You have to believe that nothing is impossible with God. Amen? Let's worship, y'all.
hero's journey Are you lost in my mistakes? It looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your strength And my story isn't over My story's just begun If you want to find me Cause that's what my father does If you want to find me Cause that's what my father does Father's house right here. Leave your shame at the door. It's not welcome here. I love that line of that song. I was saying in the last service, this past week I was thinking about anchors, right? I was in the Navy. I was a chief. It was a symbol of being a chief. And I was just thinking about anchors because some people look at anchors different way than other people look at anchors. You see, there's some people who look at an anchor and they look at what it's holding you back from what it's holding you down to. This relationship's holding me back from this. This job is holding me back from this. It's not allowing me to get to this. But then when you read the Bible, it talks about a, a different type of an anchor. It talks about that Jesus is your anchor. In Hebrews 6:19, it talks about being steadfast in hope. Steadfast in hope. And as I thought about it, I realized 
That godly anchor isn't holding you down, it's holding you up to the truth God has in store for your life. So whatever is holding you back today, cast that anchor off. Let it go and set your anchor in something true. Because God doesn't waver with whatever's going on around you. God is always true. He's the same God then is is now. And he always will be in your life. Set your anchor there. If a storm were to roll in, you're going to want your boat to be safe. So you're going to set your anchor for safety. Set your life the same way. Do that by anchoring up to hope. Anchoring up to freedom. Anchoring up to peace and joy. So I don't know what you're going through today, but we're going to have prayer partners who are going to come up here. Tell them about what's anchoring you down. And together, together, let's begin to set our anchor in what God has in store for your life. That's all we have. You heard your children then. You hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then. And you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are a healer. 
So, Lord, I thank you for your presence right here this morning, Lord. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing right here at One City Church in Chesapeake, Virginia, Lord. I pray and I know, Lord, that what you're doing here can become a ripple effect throughout the 757, throughout Virginia, and throughout this nation, Lord. Because, Lord, you've done it before and I know you can do it again. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for the steadfast hope that you give each and every single one of us here, Lord. Mostly, Lord, I just want to thank you for your love. I thank you for the example of love that you show me so that I can show that to those around me. Lord, you're just such a great God. And there's no way we can just pack you into one little box, Lord, because you're so much more, so much more than that, Lord. And Lord, as we begin to hear the message this morning, we prepare to hear the message, Lord. I pray over the distractions that might come across, Lord. I pray that this time is just a time to focus on what word you've brought Pastor Jared to bring to each one of us here in this room and whoever's listening online right now, Lord. Lord, I believe you have a word for someone in this room that you're going to deliver today. And because of that, somebody's going to be set free from something that's holding them back, Lord. And I thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I thank you over what you're doing right here, right now. And in your most precious name I pray, amen. Please take your seats and turn your attention to the screen. church y'all can do better than that good morning church it is good to be with you if you are new with us today my name is jared i have the unique honor of serving as lead pastor of this amazing community of people uh, that we get to call a church and and witness what god does here week in and week out and so if you're a guest with us today man let me be the first to just welcome you into this family uh there's no better family to be a part of than the family of one city i promise you that I promise you that. And so, so this week, we actually kick back, or I can't say kick off, we pick back up 
with our series, The Starting Line. Last week, we took a break from our regularly scheduled programming to have Pastor Craig Grishel, uh bring a word for, for Football Sunday. Come on, if you enjoyed that, give him a hand clap. That was an amazing word that we received last week. But this week, we're going back into the starting line. And so when we started this series, we started it off by answering the question, why are we here? Why are we here? And we talked about how to answer that question, we must step up to the starting line of the Trinity, the starting line of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what did we take away? That our purpose in this world is to reflect God in everything that we create, to bring peace into the chaos of the world, and then to love people the way Jesus loves people. Now this week, we are going to continue on the starting line journey by looking at another question that I want to get to in just a second. But before we get there, let me just ask a question. Show of hands. How many of y'all seen the movie The Blind Side? Just, all right, oh, ooh, so a lot of y'all. You need to stop watching so much TV is what you need to do. So, so, so The Blind Side, if, if you haven't seen it, it's this real life drama that covers a guy by the name of Michael Orr. He was this, this massive kid who grew up on the streets of Memphis, and then he ends up being uh, adopted by the grace of God into this incredible family. And, and, and at the head of this family was a husband and a wife, and the wife was a powerhouse mama. She was that type of mama that just looked after all of her kids. How many know this? There's no protection like a mama's protection, yeah. right? And so, and so she just had that mama instinct in her. She looked after all of those kids, and she watched out for Michael. And you probably know this story, but I'll give you the short version of it. He goes to a private school, and because he's so massive, he's, he's this like shiny object for the football coach. And so he sees him. And he puts him out on the field. And you know, the coach is excited until he realizes that internally, Michael doesn't have that aggression that he thought he would have. He's too passive to, to impose his strength on the football field. And so the coach sort of gives up on him, becomes discouraged, sees him as a, as a wasted object. But there was that mama. And the mama saw something a little bit different. And so she goes to the coach and she challenges him and she says, hey, listen, you're using him wrong. He's not an aggressor, he's a protector. And so I need you to put him in a role that allows him to protect people. And so they put him in a position, which the movie is titled after, into the blind side, meaning that he protects the backside of the quarterback. So when the quarterback's about to pass, there's a part of him he can't see, that's what Michael protects. And the moment that he's placed into that role, all of a sudden, he starts to flourish. Wow. He has this incredible high school career. He earns this full scholarship in college. And eventually, he ends up being drafted by the Baltimore Ravens, has a stellar NFL career as well. And so there's this success story here, but it forces us to ask the question, what would Michael's life have looked like if his mama hadn't seen him for who he really was? If she hadn't had the conversation, if she hadn't gone to coach and say, he's not an aggressor, he's a protector. You mislabeled him. What would his life have looked like? I assume he would have just listened to coach and assumed he was terrible at football and went down some other path. We would never have heard the story of Michael Orr because he would have never discovered his true identity. See, the story of Michael Orr is a very similar story that many of us right now are also standing in. Somewhere along your life, some well-meaning person, man, maybe it was a coach or a teacher or a parent, maybe it was a well-meaning ex or a boss that you worked with, somewhere in your life, they misidentified your identity. They placed a label on you that was not the label that was supposed to be placed on you. And so instead of striving to be called up to what God called you to, you settled to be called down to what a man called you to. It's because when you were created, you were created with what? With purpose. 
And God placed gifts in you to carry out the purpose that he envisions for your life. But when labels from the exterior, from the external become placed on my life, I no longer strive to God's calling. I settle for the world's calling. Some of us are there right now. You're not living up to what God's called you to. You're living down to what someone's called you to. And somewhere along the line, many of us in the room may have had some person come alongside of us, see our true potential, see our true identity, and then help us discover it ourselves. But then others, your heart's racing a little bit right now because you know in your gut that you are not living up to the potential that God has called you to. Like you know that you were created for something more, but the problem is every day you wake up and you look in the mirror and you see this reflection and it's that reflection that's keeping you from getting to what God's called you to. And that reflection that we see in the mirror, it comes with a voice and, and that voice says a lot of things to us and sometimes that voice says this, you're not good enough. You'll never live up to what I'm asking you to live up to because you're too broken. Who do you think you are? Dreams the kind of dreams that you're dreaming. Who do you think you are? That can't be you. This isn't your story. Go back to your brokenness. At least there you know what to expect. And before you know it, we start to believe it. You know, there's so much power in a seeded lie. If you're not careful, the lies that are planted in your mind will begin to lead you more than the truth of the Bible. Why? Because the, the Bible is a book. The lies are in your mind. But I need to say this to someone. You were created for more. There is a greater purpose in your life. There, there is something that you are called to that is higher than what you're experiencing today. And if there's anything you're going to take away from today, lean in and take this. Sometimes the reason we haven't stepped into our calling is because we stepped out of our identity. I'll say it this way. Sometimes the reason we're not walking in our calling is because we walked out of our true identity, our authentic identity. And so many of us, we sit here right now, not how God created us to be. We put on some adaptive disguise. We put on some different personality, and we've learned to call that normal. And so today we exist and we're striving to carry out all these goals and all these missions that we've placed on our lives, not in the manner that God called us to, but in the manner the world created you to. The reason you haven't stepped into what God has for you is because you stepped out of how God created you. <laughs> so today, for the next part two of our series, The Starting Line, I want to preach a message that I want to call, Who Am I? Who am I? Look at the person next to you and say, who are you? Now look to the other side and say, who am I? Now look at me and say, let's find out. <laughs> All right, let's go. Who am I? What is my identity? Who am I really? That is a question that so many individuals wrestle with every day of their life. Who am I? And today, I want to start moving in a direction that lays a foundation to answer that very question. Who are you? Who are you really? And so if you have a Bible with you, you can open it uh, to the starting line of the Bible, the book of Genesis, where we'll be throughout this whole series. Today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 26. Here's, we see God not only creating humanity in this verse, but we also see God creating the identity of humanity in this verse as well. And so Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says this, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground and in the original hebrew language the author actually uses a word that means entire earth 
And so in the, in the Hebrew, what Genesis 126 is saying is God said, let us make man in our image so that they may rule over the entire earth. Now notice, I've highlighted three phrases in this one verse of scripture, and we're going to live here all day. Three phrases that I believe are key to understanding not only my identity, but also the God-given purpose that is placed on my life as well. And so today I want us to look at each one of these phrases and see not only what can we learn about God, but what can we learn about our own identity as well. You all ready? Say, let's move. Let's move. All right. Number one was that first phrase, let us. Let us. Us. You know, Genesis 126 is one of the most important and one of the most interesting verses that we see in the entire Bible. Look at it again. It starts off by this. Then God said, let us. God doesn't say, let me. God doesn't say, watch me. God doesn't say, I will. He says, let us. And what we need to understand is that from the very beginning, from the very first starting line, you were created to be in community with God, to be in community with him. The first thing I need to understand about God is that God is a we God. He's not a me God. He's into communal relationships, not isolated relationships. And so he says in scripture, God himself calls, refers to himself as what? As us. And of course, we know this from week one. He's talking about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. But the concept of community is critical for us to embrace if we want to understand the foundation of our identity. How many know this? When God created you, he designed you for community. He didn't design you to go isolated every time life gets tough. He didn't design you just to show up to church when your life gets put back together. He didn't design you just to get comfortable to go into a small group when you feel comfortable with your life. He didn't design you to run away from the very solution to your brokenness because you haven't found it yet. He designed you for community. And whether you've been in church your whole life or this is your first day in church, this is a concept that most of us tend to truly understand. Because whether I'm strong in my faith or I'm weak in my faith, one thing all of us can sense is when there's a breakdown in community. When my community starts to fall apart, when the people who were once around me are no longer around me, we tend to understand that. And you know, Christians, you know what we'll say a lot of the time? Oh, that's just God pruning. Is it or is that you running? Oh, God's just pruning. What if you got pruned? <laughs> and so it says, it, it says that there's a breakdown in community. You know, this concept was actually studied like in depth in a book called Bowling Alone. It's this amazing book that goes into the, the research and the depth of, of the breakdown of communities, specifically within America. And in that book, it actually says that the breakdown of community is one of the main reasons we see so many young people running as fast as they can toward, towards this kind of tribalism, trying to find a brand new identity in lifestyle groups. And Christians hate it. Christians hate watching all these other groups parade and march and saying all these things. And they say, you just need Jesus. The problem with that is this. Christians get so distracted being angry at other groups, they don't see the deterioration of their own. Amen. We're so busy looking at what everyone else is doing, we're not seeing the very demise of community within our church, within our communities, within our people. But as long as I'm yelling at someone else, it looks like I'm faithful. It's a breakdown of community. You can't run from that. You were created with it. It's inborn. God created you for community. From the very beginning, it is in your nature to be more we than me. This is going to sting, but I got to say it. So many of us right now, you will never experience the full power of your faith because all your faith does is look inward. 
God, I, I need you. God, I need this. God, please do this. God, please do that. God, please let me have that. God, please put me in this position. God, please give me that title. God, please give me this role. Sometimes the only thing more selfish than your heart is your prayers. <laughs> but this is important to understand. Because if we never understand the concept that self-consumption, self-glorification might be the barrier getting in the way of the blessings of your life, you will continue to walk yourself down a road that has a dark ending. That has a dark ending. We love we. We love me. We, we're so self-consumed. Especially in the Western world. In our culture today, we have this learned behavior to become so focused on the I Focused on the me. Think about even like the way we introduce ourselves to people. Hey, would you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm Jared. I'm a pastor. I like music. I like baseball. I have kids. I have a wife. I work in this industry. I, 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 I. <laughs> Everything, even from the beginning of a relationship, we make it all about us. We let everyone know all I first care about is me. I want you to be obsessed with me, and then maybe I can care about you. I, 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 I. And then we wonder why we're dissatisfied with life. Because you weren't created for the me. You were created for the we. Community is part of your identity. Whether you like it or not, it's how God created you. Let us Lean in. Your identity is not defined by you. It's just experienced by you. Amen. Your identity is defined based on what God created you to be, based on the community he placed you in to contribute. Hear me when I say it. Not the community he placed you in to consume, but to contribute. You wonder why we make such a big deal out of small groups, why you've seen texts come out and emails come out and we talk about it at church. You think we care about the numbers of our small groups? We don't. What we care about is people who call this church home finding their authentic identity and we understand without community, you can't find it. You can't step into the life God's calling you for. Why? Because you were created for community, not for isolation. When you isolate from people, you isolate from your calling. You isolate from your purpose. That's why we talk about small groups. And I don't know who needs to hear this, but I gotta say it. If you're in a relationship right now, and that relationship is pulling you out of your community, and using the excuse, I just want to spend the free time you have with you, that's called unhealthy. A healthy person, a healthy relationship understands the value of community. Someone who's in a healthy relationship has a partner or a spouse or, or that other part of the relationship that says, I need you in community. Why? Because I need the best version of you. Amen. And how many know this? The best version of ourselves comes when we are needed and when we are known. And so it's within the small group setting that I become needed to contribute and I become known by people other than just who I'm comfortable showing myself to. Let us, it's community, it's communal, let us. You weren't designed to be isolated, so stop making yourself that way when you need community more than ever. And so that's the first truth. Now the second truth that I want to look at out of Genesis 1.26 is embedded in the next phrase that we looked at, that we underlined, and it was this, our image. Our image. Read it again. 26, Genesis 1 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in what? Our image. One more time. Let us make mankind in what? Our image. One more time. Let mankind in our image. image. What does it mean? What does it mean when the Bible says that God made mankind in his image? I mean, obviously, 
It's not the physical image of God because what? God is spirit. And so when God says, I want to make mankind in our image, what's he talking about? And so to understand the image of God, we first must understand what? The character of God and the nature of God. And how do we learn that? By looking at the characteristics of God. And I need to say this real quick because we'll hear in scripture, God made me in his image and we'll start getting a little puffed up. We'll start getting a little proud, like, you know, God, I am God. <laughs> Throwing sticks on the ground, trying to make them turn into snakes. <laughs> There's still qualities and traits that are specific to God that we will never share with him, right? The, just, just when we think about things like omnipotence, right, being all-powerful, we'll never have all power. Omniscience, having all knowledge, We'll never have all knowledge. In fact, it was that very desire where the original sin came from. Omnipresence, just just being everywhere at one time, that is never going to be in our cards. That's only in God's cards. And so what I'm interested at looking at today are the characteristics that we do uniquely share with God. And I'll say it this way, characteristics that we share with God that no other species does. And the first one, I want to look at three real quick. And the first one, I think, is the creativity of God. The creativity of God. We create art as people. Everywhere that we go, we create different kinds of art. We create music and we create poetry. We create literature. We create books. We create all kinds of of, of art. Like, you can't go anywhere in the world without seeing some kind of art. You go in, uh, you know, to, to your church and you got paintings on the walls and you go to your home and you got splashes of color in your home, right? We, we, we plant things all around our property to bring, to bring color to it. And man, we dress in the latest uh, current fashion. Tr- oh, I mean, most of, some of us, a few of us do. A few of us do. A couple others, we're praying hard about it. Like, we, love, you ever, like we, we don't even get out of bed before we hear music and, and then we seldomly go to bed like without some sort of entertainment on television or something along. Like we're, we're constantly surrounded by art, like our cars and our offices and our homes and our churches. They're, they're all decorated with this human representation of what beauty is. And there is no species that creates things like people, Ever. It's unique to people. I mean, we have these sanctuaries of art that we call museums. It's almost as if God took the creativity of him and placed it in every person. And and, and here's what we can do is we can start to compare our creativity. Yeah, well, she's a better singer than I am, so I'm not a singer. Yes, you are. I think sometimes we feel like God made a mistake when he created some of us. He did not. You just haven't found the true you yet. And so creativity, it feels like it was reserved specifically for for this species, for humanity. Now, the second characteristic that I think we share with God is not only creativity, but time. In more ways than one. Man, from the moment we get up, what's the first thing we check? What time is it? And so many of y'all still late. (laughs) I can't (laughs) say... So many of y'all still so late. <laughs> I mean, we got clocks. We got watches. We got iPhones. We got Apple watches. We got sundials. 426 ways to tell you you're still late. I'm not going to make eye contact with my wife, but she's going to know that I'm looking over her, right, in this example. <laughs> You know, it's funny with Danielle. Uh, yesterday, this, this is just last night, Danielle, uh, we're, we're getting ready to go to bed, and she's talking about, she's getting ready for ladies' night tonight. Ladies' night tonight, y'all. Ladies, be there. It's going to be awesome. Um, you can see amazing uh, panel discussion that you're not going to want to miss. Uh, and, and so she's getting ready for that last night, and, she, and I'm like, hey, you better go to bed, right? And she's a late, uh, late night person. I'm, I'm like, as early as early gets. And, and, and so I'm like, you better go to get some rest. And she's like, well, it, I will. She said, but you know, I get up before you. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And she's like, every Sunday, I'm always up the same time. I'm up before you. And I'm like, hey, what time do you get up? 
And she's like, 10 to 5. <laughs> 10 to 5? I'm like, are you planting a church before you go to church? <laughs> Why do you need so much time? But like we as creation, as people, we have this insatiable connection to time. We either want more of it or we're afraid that we're losing it. And so we dissect our days and put things on calendars and memorialize days with birthdays and anniversaries and and we just have this connection to time. You know what other species has that? None. Zero. I promise you, no matter how well trained your dog is, he's not putting something on the calendar this afternoon. (laughs) Promise you. I promise you this. You're not buying an Apple Watch for your cat. You know, if you are, you need Jesus. (laughs) For real. But it's because they don't have that in their DNA. They don't have this connection to time the way that people have a connection to time. It is hardwired into us. And God uses it even though he's above it. That's the characteristic he places in us. Because we exist in the moment. We exist within the constraints of of time. But there's something in our heart that tells us eternity is near. Church, one of the most similar things about time that we share with God is the understanding that we too live above it. What you do in your life today to impact your tomorrow weighs nothing compared to what you do to impact your eternity. The time that we spend here on earth is a sliver compared to the time you will spend in eternity. And so many of us, we get distracted by trying to make our time now as comfortable as possible. And many people sacrifice their eternity for the the now. And so God, when he created us, he put something on our hearts. And maybe you haven't experienced this yet, but you will. Something on our hearts that draws us to an eternal meaning, not a worldly meaning. You know, out of all the funerals and all the people we've had the chance to be with towards the end of their life, you never hear people say, I wish I would have had more stuff. Never. Always more time. Why do they want more time? Because they neglected the things that mattered when they had it. That's a trait we share with God. And so not only do we share creativity, not only do we share time, but the third one that I want to look at is language. You know, God uses language to communicate his love with us different than any other species. No one else has the advantage of communicating with God the way that we communicate with God. And I know, like, I say that, and people, like, you get smart, and you're like, yeah, well, I saw a gorilla sign language. I'm like, go to the gorilla for counseling. We'll see how it works, right? And so, like, but I understand that there's the advanced calls and there's advanced, like, like communication with, with different species, but no one uses language like we do. No one has the ability like we do to do things like write poetry. I know birds can sing, but can they truly sing? Have they ever put together a melody? Have they ever put together a story and song? I know this, I know that when I come to church, I know that when Tananda is being led by the Holy Spirit and she begins to sing out her worship, there is something that happens that I've never felt anywhere else. We have the ability to use language different than any other species, and I'll tell you why. Because God wants us to express what's inexpressible. That we would share with one another something no other species gets to share, the love of God in language. Think of it this way. Even when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, if that's new to you, don't worry about it. But if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, evidenced by what? Speaking in tongues. What are speaking in tongues? A prayer language between God and me. I love that God does that. God says, when you're fully in my presence, you will speak a language that only I will understand. Me and you and no one else. That's the power of language. 
no other species is given that. I just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit right now. He says, it's me and it's you. You know what's so powerful about those three characteristics, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, is that they're not supernatural, they're ordinary. I didn't say, you know what we share with God? Our ability to call someone out of the grave. I didn't say, you know what we share with God? The ability to pray for someone and immediately make them healthy. What I'm talking about is the ordinary parts of our life, the everyday moments. These characteristics that we share with God through his creation, being made in his image, they're accessible in the boardroom, they're accessible in the bedroom, they're accessible in a coffee shop, they're accessible in the church. We are most like God in our most ordinary moments. When we are existing in the way he created us to exist. And yet we live in a world that puts so much pressure on us to become a version of ourselves that God is not asking you to become. God is not worried about your accomplishments. He's not worried about your certifications or your awards. He's worried about your willingness to exist in the way he created you to exist. In your authentic self. Are you willing to be in his image? Are you willing to reflect his likeness? Are you willing to be you? Not the version the world stressed you into, but the version you were created in. Church, we were created in his image, built for community, designed for community. And I'll say it again, turn your phone off. <laughs> Austin, you like, you like that one. Yeah, yeah, I see it on your face. So... I'll say it again. You're nervous now. I get it. I feel it too. We're most like God in our most ordinary moments. Stop trying to be someone God's not calling you to be. Stop trying to turn into a version of yourself God's not asking you to. Stop exalting what the world tells you to be over what God calls you to be. You're already made in his image. Allow it to manifest. Allow it to manifest. And so let us make mankind in what? Our image. And then that leads us to the third point that I want to look at today. The third phrase from Genesis 126, and it's this. Rule over. To rule over. Let us look at this whole verse again real quick. It says this, Genesis 126. Then God said... What? Let us make mankind in what? Our image, in our likeness, so that they may what? Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so it says, God creates us to rule over creation. And when we look at, at that translation, another word that is used for rule over is what? It's dominion. God calls us to have dominion over his creation. Notice I said dominion, not domination. God calls us to foster, to improve, to build upon the very thing that he gave us to steward. Someone needs to receive this. You are a steward. You are not a master. Stop treating the people in your life like you are their master. It is not a domination thing. It is a dominion thing. See, when I challenge someone, but I'm unwilling to support them, all I'm doing is dominating them. I'm, I'm, I'm getting them to take action out of fear, out of obligation, out of guilt. God doesn't call us to dominate. He calls us to liberate. See, when I liberate someone, I fight for the highest possible good in their life. I challenge them because it's healthy, but I support them just as much. Church, so many of us right now, God has given you things and people to care for, and you are dominating them instead of liberating them. God doesn't say domination. He says dominion. 
Meaning that when he created humanity, the pinnacle of his creation, the greatest part, day six stuff, when he created people, he then gave them an assignment to make a world out of what he gave us to steward. Not just to protect what he already had in place, but to build upon it. Like this is an incredible thought if you allow your mind to wrap around it. God created the heavens and the earth, and then he filled up all the space with stuff in between, and he created people, and he said, build something out of it. Care for it. Improve upon it. Church, it is our divine responsibility to leave this world better than we found it. To leave our communities better than we found them. To leave our families better than when we started them. To take dominion over what God placed in our care. To liberate it. To support it and challenge it. To fight for the highest possible good of what God has placed under your care. And so we have these different sectors in the world, and we have business and, and government and education, nonprofits and churches. We have media and arts, entertainment, and sports and healthcare. And all of these different sectors, they are born out of our hearts and out of our hands and, and out of our minds. But I need to challenge this church. We must make sure that those industries outside of the church reflect God as much as we do. We can't just leave God in the church building on Sunday and then hope he's still there the next week. It's why what we're going to do next week with our kingdom offering is so important. And Man, if this is your first time here, this doesn't apply to you, but our kingdom offering is our biggest offering of the year. It's when we use it to make the greatest impact we can possibly make. If you are new and you're, you just feel like, man, I'm supposed to be here, man, we invite you to be a part of that for sure. But we as a church have been given this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to actually build something in this community that brings change into this community. That God's giving us the opportunity to go into the places that God has been ripped out of and say, we are back. We are here. Rip God out of the schools. It doesn't matter. You know why? Because I'm going into the schools. Rip Jesus out of business. You know why? It doesn't matter because I'm in business. Take Jesus out of healthcare. It doesn't matter. You know why? Because we got Christians in the healthcare field. We are no longer going to just stand back and watch Jesus get ripped out of the very places that need him most. We're no longer talking about keeping lights on and putting new carpet in. We're talking about flipping our community upside down because we understand that the presence of God is worth it. That's what we're doing, church. And next week, if we bring God our very best, it will start a journey where what we do here at one city will be felt as a ripple effect through our entire community. Every one of those sectors that I mentioned will be met with the presence of God. Met with the presence of of Jesus, that we as a church will become the foundation to building a community that is rooted in compassion, rooted in social responsibility, rooted in love, rooted in, in transformation. Next week is going to tell us a lot about the future of this church.
But if we accept the mission, if we say, God, I give you my very best, no matter what that looks like, and here's what I need you to know, that might mean some of us, you go home, starting today, you're fasting, you're praying, you're saying, God, what would you have me give to what you're trying to do? Where can I decrease so you can increase? If we go home with that question and next week we come back with an answer, all of us, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, will still be telling the story about what God did through this little place called One City. And we'll tell the story to people. And they're going to hear this story of community transformation. And they're going to see the city of Chesapeake and Norfolk, Virginia Beach, the 757, as a completely new place. And they're going to say, how did it happen? And you're going to start talking them through it. And they're going to be like, you got to see that? And you're going to say, I didn't just see it. I played a major part in it. Your legacy starts now. Next week is the starting line of our church. It is the starting line of our community. It is the starting line of transformation in this city. And we need everyone. We need every business person. I need every teacher. We need every stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad. I need every police officer. I need every person in the military. I need every firefighter. I need every engineer. I need any person who believes and was willing to commit to the mission to leave this world better than we found it. That's who we're looking for. That's what we're looking to walk into. Not just an experience on Sunday that makes you feel good for about an hour and 15 minutes and then sends you back out broken. We're looking to build something that every person that comes into this building, no matter where God places it, comes face to face with the presence of God and is never the same again. when we walk into our new building and then shortly thereafter we open that counseling center and we partner with that professional counseling agency that's going to have licensed counseling right there on site you know what else we're going to see we're going to see even the evil of this world turned into an opportunity to show the light of God and the love of God onto a city that's suffering from brokenness even the evil of this world will be turned into good at the hands of Jesus because of the obedience of one city church time it's time for us to decrease so he can increase because there are far too many churches right now more worried about their systems and their attendance than about the very people coming in their doors broken and it is our responsibility to begin to change that. It is our responsibility to curb the natural appetite to self, for self-glorification. It is our responsibility to curb the church's natural appetite to exalt themselves just as much as Jesus so that pastors feel powerful in the pulpit. It's our responsibility to reduce things like prejudice and racism and hate. It's our responsibility to reduce the need for prisons and for safe houses and for addiction recovery facilities. Do you know why? Not because we don't believe in the work that they do, but because we know that when I put you face to face with Jesus, you are changed and changed for good. The question is not what is God going to do? The question is what difference will you make next week? Come on, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your presence here today. I thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Father, I thank you for the identity that you impart in us today. Father, I thank you that you built us for community. I thank you that you've made us in your image and that you've given us dominion to steward. 
over the things you've placed in our care. Help us all to remember that we are stewards, not masters. And maybe you're in this place today and you've been walking with an identity and with a label that has been placed on you by the world, not by God. And maybe during this time today, you said, I'm done settling for what the world says I'm worthy of and I'm ready to to strive and to stand up to what God calls me to. And if that's you with all heads bowed, all eyes closed, and you want to put on the identity of Christ and take off the identity of the world, then on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. I believe the Holy Spirit's speaking to people. I believe there's people here right now who are done settling for what the world says they're worthy of and are ready to step into what God calls you to. If that's you, and you want to start that journey of faith, walking side by side with Jesus, then on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. We see your hands. We see your hands. Raise your hand. Yeah, Holy Spirit sees you. Holy Spirit is speaking to you. That's it. Celebrate it. Celebrate it, church. Come on, clap your hands. Clap your hands. People are giving their life to Jesus. People are giving their life to Jesus. Father, we thank you for every hand raised today. We thank you because we know that not only are you going to impart in them a brand new identity, but you are going to walk with them in this world, lead them to a brand new purpose, and protect them from the evil of this world. And if you raised your hand today, we want to pray with you, but at One City, no one's ever going to pray alone. So let's pray this prayer together. Say, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you sent your Son, Jesus, to take my place on the cross, to die, to be buried, and to rise again so my relationship with you can be restored. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Therefore, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. And all God's people said amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. I believe that anytime someone gives their life to Jesus, man, we need to celebrate like no other. Can we do it one more time? Give the Lord a shout of praise. Next week it starts, church. Spend this time in prayer. Ask God what he would have you give, what, how he would have you contribute. Because this city, as we know, is about to change. I'll see y'all next week. It's so exciting. I'm so glad you're here with us today. My name is Lisa. This is my friend Veronica, and we are your Connections hosts for today. If you are new with us at One City, boy, did you pick the day to come. And we would love for you to take this connection card out from the seat back pocket in front of you, or if you're in the front row, from the seat back pocket behind you, and fill this out. You can drop it either in one of the giving boxes on the way out, or even better, take it to the One City tent and give it to one of our volunteers there. You can ask any questions that you might have. What I'll tell you is we will not show up at your house later on and knock on your door or look in your window or anything like that. But what we will do is give a donation to PIN Ministries. That stands for People in Need Ministries for every one of these cards we receive from a first-time guest. That helps us to support our community, those that are the most in need with food and clothing and other resources that they need. A couple of announcements for you tonight at 5.30 is Ladies' Night here at One City. If you are a lady, we want you here at 5.30. I'll be here. Veronica's going to be here. And uh, you can go on our website, weareonecity.com, or on the Church Center app and sign up for that because we want you here with us. We also have small groups starting this week. Pastor Jared already explained to you why they're important. What I'm going to tell you is there's a group for you. There's a group for young adults. There's a group for 50-plus There's a group for couples. There's groups for women. There's groups for men. There's groups that are open to anybody. There is a group for you. So again, go to our website, go to the Church Center app, find the group that works for you, and sign up for that today. Good morning, One City. I want to talk with you about ways to give. It's time that we honor God in our giving. There's actually multiple ways that you can give. You can give through our Church Center app. 
which I love the Church Center app. You can also text One City, which is one word, to 94000. You can actually also cash app us or go to weareonecity.com. If you would like to place uh, offering through our tithing envelopes, we have those in the back seats and for you guys in front in the seat pocket behind you. And you can drop that in our tithing bins at the back of the sanctuary or in the lobby. So guys, let's prepare our hearts for um, praying over our offering. Father God, we come to you today, Father God, and we just thank you. We want to honor you in our giving, Father God. We want to honor you because you bless us to be a blessing to others. So, Father God, as we go into our hearts and we give back to your kingdom, Father God, we know that if we even give the little, that you'll make it much. So, Father God, just touch this offering, multiply that, may, that it may meet the needs of others in our community. Father, keep us this week. Keep your word upon our hearts and upon our lips, Father God, that we may even encounter people that we are able to share the gospel with. So, Father God, we just thank you for what you're doing, what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, One City, you enjoy the remaining of your Sunday.